I think looking at Porek and the role he has played, we come to an irony in history. The backroom players never get acknowledged, and yet they, they remain the essential part of the solution. People who are in the Foreign Service, people who are in the UN, oh my God, you know, they can't do what Porek does. That's their, why there are the Poreks of the world. Porek's goal was to get them in the same room to listen to the South Africans, and he accomplished that goal, and it hadn't been done before. There are many of us who know him who haven't really figured out what motivates him. And when you try to take the conversation in that direction, it sort of runs out. It, it, it doesn't get very far. Uh, my name is Porik. I'm an alcoholic. I'm often concerned about the, uh, the quality of my uh, sobriety. Yeah, I keep my life. Mm. One part is here, one part is here, one part is here. Each part has its own so you're personality. A con man. A what? Around this table, we are brothers and sisters in a family that has experienced distress, trauma dispossession. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. What we've just watched is a trailer for a film called The Peacemaker. It's a film by James Demo, and I have here with me today uh, James Demo and uh, the subject of the film, Porig O'Malley. Thank you for coming. Nice to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, this film was shown last night at the Vermont International Film Festival. It won an award in the Middlebury Film Festival. Is that correct? Uh, Middlebury New Filmmakers Festival. It won the jury award for Best Documentary. Yeah. And I'm very glad that I decided to stay because I was going to leave and then I stayed. And I was really taken by the film and your story, the storytelling. Um, and but particularly at the end by um, what you had to say in response to a question from the audience about the impact of your work. What I heard the question say was, um, you're out there doing great work and it's having an effect. And you had um, not so hopeful things to say in response to that. So I'm wondering if you want to talk about that a little bit. Well, uh, somebody sent me an Instagram picture this morning of a mule. And it said, um, pity the mules. The mules do all the heavy lifting in the world, all the heavy lifting of suffering. And um, the world is full of suffering. Uh, there are still billions of people who live under Half the world's population still live under close to or under the uh, poverty level. Uh, there are enormous refugee uh, and migration problems that are only going to get worse. And um, we as a society, not just in the United States, you could say particularly in the United States, but also in Europe, are unwilling to look at or share the resources we have with the greater number of human beings in the world. And this poses uh, increasing difficulties and polarization because as the world and the globe has grown smaller and information more diffuse, um, even people in the most uh, abysmal and despicable economic and social circumstances all have access to smartphones. Uh -huh. So they see how we live and they see how we think of them. And this, this kind of hastens, or particularly among young people, it, 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 it hastens a, a, a movement towards forms of radicalization and extremism 
because they feel left out and they feel permanently left out, just as many people in this country, uh, who may, many of whom may have been voted for Donald Trump, are people who have felt left out, uh, not just recently, but for generations, who, who see that life as a struggle, trying to put two family incomes together to make ends meet, always looking at their credit statements, being harassed by banks on the move all the time, worrying about the price of food, the price of petrol, the price of education, and life is hard. Uh -huh. And we have forgotten that. We have forgotten how we, and I think when I say we, I use we as being somebody who is relatively well off, uh, who has a, a, a good standard of, of living. It's so easy to forget, so easy to forget. In the societies in which I work, they're all deeply divided by either by ethnicity or by religion um, or by you know, there are intercommunal conflicts. And the best one can uh, hope to do is just to ameliorate some of those conflicts, to rest, lessen the tensions, hope that you can lay the groundwork for some forms of reconciliation. But reconciliation is a, a long-run process. Uh -huh. It's intergenerational. Uh -huh. And the trauma of conflict, which we always never think of, when we look at a migrant, we never think that person has gone through not just a lifelong traumatic event, but now there is research that shows that trauma is biologically transmitted, called epi epigenetic uh -huh. trauma. Yeah so that it goes from one generation to the next, even when the cause of that conflict or that trauma is initially, is, is initially eliminated. So that's the short answer to the question. That's, <laughs> that's the short answer to one question. Yeah. It brings up a lot more yeah. questions. Maybe give the audience um, a little bit of background, James, about this film. How would you sum it up? Um, and how, what, what made you decide to make this film? Well, I, I first heard of Pork's story in a, a really well-known bar in Massachusetts called the Plow and Stars. It's uh, known as sort of a center for um, music, and the literary magazine Plowshares was started out of the back of the bar. And I, I'd heard of it, and it was the best Guinness in town, and I was living in Cambridge at the time. And um, someone told me that Porig, who owned the bar, um, was in Iraq, and he was meeting with the highest levels of um, the Iraqi um, peace process, the, the Sunni, Shia, and Kurd leadership. And the questions just immediately were raised. Why is Porig in Iraq? Why is this bar owner doing this type of work? Then I heard that he was bringing the chief negotiators from Northern Ireland and South Africa into that conflict, this idea that uh, Martin McGuinness, who was the former chief of staff of the IRA, Cyril Ramaphosa, who was uh, uh, Nelson Mandela's chief negotiator, could tell the stories, the narrative of their um, conflicts and help the Iraqis. And I thought that was interesting and I had to know more. And then I think I heard Porig was um, uh, walking around the green zone looking for an AA meeting and that he was uh, in recovery. And not only was he in recovery, but that his peacemaking model was derived from the recovery model. That by bringing these cultures into a conflict that could share their stories is not unlike one person in recovery talking to another person in recovery. So I had to meet him. Um, and I asked um, through an intermediary if um, I could meet with Porig, and Porig agreed. Uh, we met in uh, uh, late one night in a library in Brookline, Massachusetts, and he told me the story of his life, his work with Mandela, his work in the Northern Irish peace process. And he was about to start um, having worked on these higher levels, um, a more of a, a, a bottom-up approach with divided cities, where stakeholders in divided cities to a conflict would get together um, and create a forum with other cities. And it was called the Forum for Cities in Transition. It was going to Kosovo as the first meeting. So I started raising money, and I, I knew it would be um, an incredible ride and exploration, and um, it took us about five years to finish the film um, and a bunch of years to, to um, do a year and a half of post-production. And what you saw last night is, is the result of that. It's mm -hmm. um, very much um, delves into both the, the past tense work of Porg and what he's currently doing now and facing. Um, and uh, 
that's the, 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 the another very short answer <laughs> yeah. uh, to your question. Was there any, you know, when you went into it, what's a big uh, left turn or a right turn? You went into it with one idea for a story, and then was there something that surprised you that came out of it? Well, I, th I think the, the film, I hope, uh, shows some truths about um, why Porg does the work. I uh -huh. think the why became bigger as we, we progressed through it. I think Porg um, is driven to the work. I think the people that do this type of work are unique. I, I don't think anyone, most of us are happy to sort of work nine to five and have family and barbecues and don't say I'm gonna go to a rock and fix that. Um, so how was this bar owner doing this was the first question, but the why this this person was doing the work became really the, the question that was really echoing in my head as the second half of the filming. And Porig, to his credit, was incredibly open and honest about sort of his journey and his thoughts and uh, about himself and, and about the work. It, was it enjoyable to make this film? Yes, you mean? Uh -huh. I forgot all about it. And uh, I, um, I don't see myself as a bar owner. Uh -huh. um, I have a, a professorship and chair in reconciliation at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Yeah. And I've been engaged in this kind of work for, uh, for 50 years. Yeah. And um, the cameras and Jim, I gave him some leads of uh, people I thought he should uh, should interview and make contact with, and uh, he did, and um, he took it from there. And um, you know, at the time, while he was doing it, I was writing a, um, a book on the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and um, it ended up by being called the the two-state delusion. Mm -hmm. uh, two states were no longer possible in Israel and Palestine. But I didn't set out to write that book. In the very same way as you asked Jim the question, did you start with an idea? Yeah. I didn't start with an idea to write that book, but uh, I accumulated the, the research and did the, um, and did the interviews and lived there. Um, it just the book began to form itself in a certain direction in my mind. So I feel that Jim went through some kind of a similar um, artistic process, that no matter where you start from in any artistic process, where you start from and where you will end up are two entirely, entirely different things. And that was his journey. Uh, my journey was what was the, the subject matter and yeah. how he chose to delineate it. Yeah. So you've been doing this work for 50 years. And that's one thing that wasn't clear to me in the film. Um, what, how, what, how did you start doing this work? Um, almost accidentally. Uh -huh. um, it, it, you could say that there were, there were one, um, my involvement in Northern Ireland. Um, now since I came to the United States in 1967, when it was just about the time that the conflict in Northern Ireland began to come into public consciousness. Um, growing up and in Ireland, um, I, um, I had no uh, interest in Northern Ireland at all. In fact, nobody in, Northern, in the Republic of Ireland had any interest in Northern Ireland. It was just a strange Protestant place under British rule. We went about our daily lives. Where did you grow up? In Dublin. Uh -huh. Um, and then I came to the United States um, to do a, um, a PhD in economics on a Fulbright scholarship. And um, after kind of winding my way through Yale and then Tufts, I ended up on a scholarship at Harvard. Um, when I discovered that I really had no interest in economics, but it was at that point, I think, in the, um, in the documentary that I decided I would like fate to determine my future, uh -huh. so to speak. So I put the entire scholarship on Muhammad Ali's first bout uh -huh. in, uh, in, in Madison Square Garden, yeah. and he lost. So that was the end of my academic career, thank God. My first academic career. And uh, at the same time, um, a Bloody Sunday uh, happened in Northern Ireland. And that was when 13 or uh, 14 young uh, men were uh, shot dead by British paratroopers in uh, Derry, Northern Ireland, during a civil rights march in the end of January 1972. And at that time, I was working in the Plow and Stars, and I organized a, um, a, um, a fundraiser for the families of the victims uh, that embraced um, all the bars in Boston 
all the Irish music bo uh, musicians in Boston. And in one night, uh, charging like two dollars a head, we raised netted out at fourteen thousand dollars, a thousand dollars for each family. And I took that money um, to Derry, Northern Ireland. The first time I'd ever been there, went down into the bog side, the Catholic ghetto there, uh, hand delivered the a, a check for one thousand dollars to each family, had it countersigned by the Bishop of, of of Derry, by the Mayor of Derry to ensure I could show people that it had not gone to the IRA, that it had actually, in fact, had gone to the families and not into my pocket. And that began my involvement in Northern Ireland. And that began a whole different path in life. And as I said, then I had this crazy idea, and it was certainly crazy that I could actually bring all the parties together yeah. in Boston at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, and that happened in uh, 2000. And uh, 15, uh, 1975. Yeah. Not that's right, that's right. Yeah. And uh, if you ask me how that happened, uh, naive, I would n naive well, um, na absolutely. I mean, there was no money, uh, there was no anything, and there were. Um, uh, and it was only then I realised the political obstacles that were put in the place of anybody who tried to people bring people together. And the kind of arrogance that you have in, in many peace circles mm -hmm. is that if you're not, quote unquote, inside, inside the belt or inside the group, it's like, who are you to assume that you can do something that mm -hmm. is supposed to be what we professionals who have had yeah. long training in this kind of thing are supposed to do? But the fact is that uh, those kind of uh, professional endeavors invariably run into the self-interest of the professionals involved. Um, and very often professionals involved have a, uh, an implicit interest in seeing that conflicts are actually lengthened. It's their business. It's a business. Peacemaking is a business. Mm. And you have to have clients. And the longer you have a client, the more business you have. So um, I like to create processes where I hope you cut through all that and you deal with the people directly. You try to empower the people to deal with each other because only they ultimately can solve their conflict. Uh, you may have theories about it, there's whole literatures about it and books written about it, but in the end it comes down to the actually people involved in the conflict mm. and how you can create or put them in a situation that fosters bonds of trust or at least lowers some of the barriers of mistrust. I want to just add to that, I, I, know this is just, I think why Porg is so effective is part of the reason that Por Porg is so effective. And in these things is that if you think about that Amherst that happened in 75, um, he was able to go on the shank hill as an Irish man, which is a Protest, a hardcore Protestant unionist um, neighborhood, and get into the, uh, go to their bars and meet them and, and, and win over their trust. And by the fact that Porig is not seen as wearing sort of the robes of a government or a big institution that he, that have certain agendas that poor could be seen as a neutral party in the work that he does. That's really effective. He's able to to win trust. And people often ask me, how does he do it? What is the, his greatest skill? I think his greatest skill is sort of on the retail level across the table from someone and getting them to trust that he's an honest broker where he'll bring the parties together let them make peace for themselves. Poor creates that opportunity for the parties to get together and have these important discussions. And getting the people to the table is often the hardest thing, mm -hmm. particularly when you're dealing with the extremes. Um, I would say it's persistence, mm -hmm. patience, perseverance. Um, I have just come off um, a project I'm involved in. It took me two years to put together. And when I went into Muslim communities in 12 European cities to try to create a forum to bring young Muslims together. This is what you're working on right now. Right now, yeah. And yeah. when I went into these neighborhoods, um, I didn't know anybody in any Muslim community in, in any of these cities. I kind of walked in. And I kept going back for two years again and again and again and again, I think 10 or 11 times until they said, why does he keep coming back? What do you, you walk in I to walk a mosque in, and, walk in mo sit and sit down and say You're right, hello? Yeah. Hello, I introduce yeah. myself. So yeah. I want to sit down, I have an idea. And in many places they would say, that's fine, I leave. And then I get somebody who connects. Yeah. But that means they listen to me. Doesn't mean they buy in. Yeah. 
It's when I come back and back and back and back and back again and again that they slowly begin un to understand that what I'm saying is not really what I'm saying, it's what they're really thinking. Mm. And then, as soon as I can, I hand over everything to, the, to those people. So, uh, for example, with the young Muslims, I, before I brought uh, 44 young Muslims together from 12 countries, uh, in fact in Ireland, at a retreat in Ireland, I spent those two years talking to a group of 22 community workers from th those cities. Then I brought them together and said, do you think it would be a good idea if you went back and each of you selected four young Muslims and you brought them to a place where they would sit together for three or four days, at the end of which they would write a charter of rights for young stigmatized Muslims? And they decided, yeah, it might be a good idea just to try that, see mm -hmm. would it work. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the decision-making moved from me to them, and it became their project, not my project. Mm -hmm. And that's the level at which I like to work, is to move things from me to others all the time. And you, this, this project that you're working on is with young Muslim men, young Muslim men and women. Men and women. M and, and in Europe, but you're also working with communities in the United States? With, we were, uh, next year we will be bringing um, um, Minneapolis um, into the Young Muslim Project. There's a very uh, large community of um, Somalis in, um, in, uh, in Minneapolis, and uh, the youngsters in Europe are anxious to have somebody come, young Muslims come from here. Yeah. And hopefully we will extend that and have young Muslims come from Canada. Yeah. So they're getting used to the idea that they own, because I created it in a way so that the youngsters become the owners of the movement. Mm -hmm. They're the shareholders. Yeah. Uh, they they uh, appoint their own board, and we are like advisors above them. But yeah. They have to take the decision about what they want to do. And then they have to, have to show us that their commitment is sufficient, that it warrants our efforts to raise funding on their behalf. So without being too esoteric about it, you, I mean, you, last night, one of the questions was sort of, do, have there been successes? And that's when you went into this very, to me, to me the film was sort of hopeful because to me you had this sense of, there's almost a sense of that naive dream state that says this is not how the world needs to be and I believe it can be different and not waiting for somebody else to make that happen, not waiting for an expert to make that happen. Although, you know, it seems like you are an expert. Or you I'm an expert, non-expert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, as far as, or as far as the successes, I mean, Porig, if there's one, I get asked also what is the greatest accomplishment Porig has done, and uh -huh. it certainly was bringing Nelson Mandela into the Northern Irish peace process yeah. a year before the Good Friday Agreement. So there is things you could sort of look to as achievements um, in some ways. But pe showing these peace processes, it's very difficult because they're incremental. And a lot of the point that Porig made last night is that a lot of the divided cities we've gone to um, with the film, with Porig, um, are no better. And in fact, they've regressed in some ways. Mitrovica, Kosovo, um, Kirkuk, Iraq. Um, you know, there, there's, there's uh, it's always an incremental process and it always needs tending not unlike Porg's model of recovery, where people in recovery need to continuously work their sobriety. Um, so Porg could talk more about that, but I, I wanted to say that Porg has had some really incredible feats um, as a peacemaker. It's just that these peace processes are up to the individuals that are in the process to, to make peace for themselves. Of course, I don't see it that way. <laughs> well, I also and my accomplishment, my accomplishment yeah. is getting sober. Yeah. That's my accomplishment not being a drunk. Yeah. The rest in one way or another is um, always peripheral. Yeah. And um, I think um, it, it, it helps every process if we don't think of it in terms of accomplishments because you can't measure in intricate, conflict-ridden, complex situations what's a success or not a success 
one could look at the uh, Northern Ireland um, Good Friday Belfast Agreement as being a, a successful a, um, uh, accomplishment mm -hmm. uh, and it certainly moved the conflict from one of violence to one of non-violence but in terms of its impact in bringing about uh, reconciliation among people uh, its quote-unquote success would be far more problematical and the inability of all the um, protagonists in that conflict uh, to deal with the past, that is to set up a truce commission to deal with the legacy of the past, uh, again it makes its long run success in terms of reconciliation more problematic. Um, it doesn't make its success in terms of a cessation of violence uh, more problematic. That phase is, is over in part because the whole terrain of what is acceptable uh, as violence, I mean the IRA and could a large segment of the um, nationalist population in Northern Ireland, not a majority, uh, or a large segment of Irish Americans saw the IRA as a national liberation movement fighting the British occupation of of Ireland to bring about the reunification of the country. Mm -hmm. Well, besides that being a, a false narrative of history, mm -hmm. uh, it was a narrative that was bought by a lot of people. Today, that narrative wouldn't, uh, post 9-11, uh, that, nar uh, that narrative has no run. Mm -hmm. There are very few Irish Americans who would ever uh, kind of go along with the resumption of IRA violence. Mm -hmm. Simply is not on. And how it would be dealt with by all authorities is so entirely different that, um, you know, in small societies, um, like the Northern Ireland conflict, which was ridden by uh, informants on all sides, you very often know where some of the main protagonists live and where they work, but you leave them where they are, in part because you know that plucking them and jailing them would only make the problem worse, not mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. In the sense of creating mm -hmm. martyrs. That's or right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you con are you sort of simply saying that our tolerance for violence has grown? Mm -hmm. Of course, because we're, sat we're saturated with it. Yeah. I mean, uh, turn on your television and um, you see at least forty or fifty people who are killed every night within uh, by violence, by car things exploding, mm -hmm. by um, by things. We are saturated with. Uh, conflicts coming in. We see Aleppo one night, we see Weimar, the refugees in Rohingya the following night. We see a famine in Africa the third night. We see mm -hmm. migrants drowning the fourth night, the fifth night. We just become immune. So is that your experience though when you, you see you're just traveling internationally still? Mm -hmm. Yes, right? all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is that your experience when you meet with people on the grassroots? Oh yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, the uh, best example I can ever think of that was um, and I, I refer to it offhandedly in the, um, in the, in, in the documentary, was um, a day in uh, Baghdad. And I was on my way to see members of the Baghdad City Council. And we got stuck in traffic. And it came across on the radio that uh, all around Baghdad, uh, 29 bombs had gone off and the city was paralyzed. Now that meant 20 side suicide bombs. That means hundreds of people had been had been killed. But this is now after like nine or ten years of suicide bombings going off every day, every day all over the place. And the Iraqis in the car were not concerned about the suicide bombings at all. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely pissed off about being stuck in traffic for three and a half hours. Mm -hmm. It was a traffic problem to mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. not about death. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, and in a way, they had to if you live in a conflict, you have to, your, your system adjusts to the conflict mm -hmm. because otherwise, uh, like particularly in places where suicide bombs go off frequently, you would be absolutely paralyzed if every time you thought that when you walked outside the door, you were possibly going to walk down that street and get kind of blown up by an IED yeah. or some other kind of anger. You couldn't live. Yeah. So you have to find a way of internalizing it in order to survive. Mm -hmm. How does that, 
is this something that you've come, is this something new in your thinking when Korg talks like this? How do you respond to it? Well, I, you know, the real sea change for me was going to these places with Korg, whether it be northern Nigeria or Kirkuk, Iraq, where, you know, we're surrounded by 600 Iraqi police and, you know, IEDs are a concern and, um, you know, seeing that the people that I've met in conflict zones, how, I was surprised how similar everyone is to me. It, everyone hopes for a roof over their head, education for their kids, um, and it's the, the fringes that are violent or sometimes more than fringes that co-opt the conversation and become the thing that, as Porig says, is on the nightly news every night. Um, I really understand how a lot of these conflicts, even though they are religious in some ways, are also economic. I think what Porig said earlier is very powerful, that economic disenfranchisement by uh, the um, Muslim population in northern Nigeria gave rise to Boko Haram. It gave rise to ISIS by the disenfranchisement of the Sunni population um, within Iraq. It gave rise to the IRA with the disenfranchisement of the Catholic population in Northern Ireland. So it's been a real lesson um, following Porg around, learning his perspective. Um, you know, Porg thinks um, in, in, in an incredible way about conflict. He's very outside the box. He's constantly maneuvering as he's trying to make these events happen. Um, and uh, that's really how my thinking has been changed. There's been a lesson in the world, um, being able to go to these, these places and seeing what's the real, what the conflict really stems from, um, what the people think of the conflict, um, and then sort of how the outside forces sometimes um, bastardize the conflict mm -hmm. in some ways. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, just been a privilege to, to watch it all and to, to ask poor questions um, about his work and his philosophies throughout. It's why we, we made the film. You know, the film, you know, at the beginning of the film, there's, and I think it's in the trailer that we showed, uh, Mac Maharaj, who is one of uh, Nelson Mandela's key advisors, um, says the backroom players never get appreciated, but yet they're the essential part of the solution. Um, and Porig is the quintessential backroom player that helps these processes move along. And um, that's why I wanted to make the film. I wanted Porig to have um, this platform in the post-screening um, discussions, but also for, for people to see the film and, and see what he's, he's been up against um, to do this work and, and, and how he's had the successes and how the conversation isn't simple, that there are, as we've discussed, um, these steps backwards in the conflicts, and there's a, an incredible personal toll to the work as well. Do you think more people, do you, do you agree with that you think outside the box? And do you think more people need to do that today? There is no box there. <laughs> <laughs> there just isn't a box. There's no box. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, one thought that I had is whether you think America is a divided country, your perspective on that right now under, after Trump's election. Um, there's a sense that people feel very polarized. Um, what do, you, what do you think about that? And is there a role for peacemaking in um, that? That certainly is true. And um, it's both uh, economic and, um, and cultural. And, um, you know, I think this country right now is at um, one of those uh, mesmerizing turning points. Uh, particularly with the, a looming constitutional crisis with um, the executive arm, the president, uh, trying to tear down the institutions of governance, um, erode trust in the rule of law, uh, turn the whole uh, Russia investigation into a, um, a, a, a conspiracy theory of it being the deep state trying to bring down a legitimately elected president. And there's a whole literature, academic literature, on the deep state, which of course does exist in, in many other countries, particularly in, um, in uh, dictatorships uh, and in, 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 in countries with centuries old in, 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 in crusted uh, bureaucracies like Egypt and, and Iraq, like with practices 
uh, going back to the days of the Ottoman in, 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 in Iraq. Um, and again, there is no, um, and, and undoubtedly, uh, the, I think the role of cable is uh, vastly over, overrated, uh, given the, the population that cable actually a, um, reaches. But I, cable I television? Yes, yeah. Yeah, but I, t I take issue as much with a program like the MSNBC, mm -hmm. um, where, uh, you know, and I always like now to watch Fox and to watch MSNBC. Mm -hmm. I want to hear how the other narrative is being played. And uh, I don't think it helps. Which one is the other narrative? Th well, the other narrative is the narrative that is propagated by Fox News, which, yeah. in fact, this has all been a conspiracy uh, to bring down a legitimately yeah. elected president, and yeah. the FBI were up to all kinds of shenanigans yeah. to bring this about. And uh, this whole Russia probe is just nothing but a charade. And the sooner it is closed down and everybody associated with it is prosecuted, prosecuted because they're, they're conspiring against them. Um, a legitimately elected president. The mm -hmm. sooner that's done, yeah. the the better. Um, this is um, and uh, this is going to come to a head. But about polarization, I think what troubles me the most is that when you see the undoing of law. Now I'm making no comparison between. I will make a, a comparison between how fascism arises and democracy is eroded. As we see bits and pieces of the rule of law being discarded or eroded or undermined, most of us live ordinary lives. Uh, we see it and we shake our heads. We say, this is awful. We get on with our lives. And then the question is, well, why didn't you do something about it? But of course, we're ordinary people. And what are we expected to do? Yeah, what are we expected to do? Do we all to take <laughs> to the streets? Well, that's fine in uh -huh. theory, but in, in reality, that never happens. It's always a very small number of people who take to the streets. Now, somehow, sometimes the way that small group is dealt with by the authorities, as happened in, in Syria, uh, the civil war in Syria, because small numbers of people took to the streets to complain about the the really the lack of services and and the levels of repression and if the the uh, uh, Assad regime had dealt with that in some way other than by shooting off everyone involved the Syria civil war would never have happened but then more people came out and mm -hmm. took the same risk and the same situation here the only chance of kind of mass coming to people on the streets is if the authorities as they always do harm the people on the street and turn peaceful protests into bloody protests. Mm. So um, I'm, I, this country is certainly not the same as the one I came to 50 years ago. And it, then it was a troubled country. We were at the height of the Vietnam War. Mm. You know, when I came here, I took a promise that I wouldn't take out citizenship until the United States was not at war. Oh. It's been at war for 50 straight so years. you're not a citizen yet. I will not take out citizenship yeah. until this country is not at war. And I certainly could not take out citizenship under the presidency of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I swear allegiance to a constitution that is being debased by the person in charge of implementing yeah. and upholding yeah, that it. that citizenship process is very serious, so yeah. It is a serious it's process. Yeah. But when you raise your hand and you swear, you want to swear to something that you believe that the commander-in-chief and the guardians of the constitution are actually guarding. Mm -hmm. But then debasing it and undermining it, mm -hmm. and that is happening here. Mm -hmm. And that's the small, slow slide to fascist practices. And how you see this come in small ways is that I come through border immigration areas, migration areas, numerous times. And I'm used to being questioned because I'm not a citizen, and particularly 9 11. It's a common practice. But since the Trump presidency, the same officials, well, they're coming off enough to deal with the same officials, just feel that little bit more empowered. They're just that little bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. That too is part of a slide, mm -hmm. a slide away from respect yeah. for the person who's coming into the country, yeah. treating him or her more as an object. Mm -hmm.
somebody that you can show how powerful you are by more aggressively asking the questions rather than politely asking them. It's small, but very important. Yeah, and it's hard to fight against in your That's own right. personal life mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, I'm feeling less hopeful mm -hmm. at this second, but you know, hope is uh, that's elastic. Mm -hmm. So nice it comes word. and it goes. Nice <laughs> word. I like that word. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we are probably about at 30 minutes. I want to see if there's. Um, I, uh, one thing I would love to mention yeah. is that we are opening the film in New York February 9th at Cinema Village yep. um, this Friday um, for anyone watching this um, that has family or friends in um, New York please tell them to come um, we'll be uh, digitally releasing the film later in the year through Sundance Creative Distribution um, so look for it on iTunes and all of that but um, Please um, join our mailing list as well at peacemakermovie.com. You can um, p send messages. You can sign up for our mailing list. And then, of course, we're on Facebook, um, the Peacemaker a documentary, and join the Facebook page. That is really hope that that's really helpful in us as we for us as we continue with our distribution. Um, so that's the way you can learn more about what's happening with the Peacemaker. Right, and. Is there anything more you want to leave us with? Or get involved. Get involved. Get involved. <laughs> Stay alert. Get involved. Live for the day. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming thank in. Thank you for having us. Keep Thanks going for having us. For a long yeah, time. This could go on and on. Um, thank you all for watching. And um, we're out. All right. Thank you. <laughs>